families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Families Divided TV. Children have a human right to family life and a human right to keep their own identity. If one parent takes control over the child and reforms the child's thoughts in a thought reform process, these human rights are severely violated. The steps are similar to recruiting cult members. Mentally kidnapped children cannot express a meaning of their own. They echo what they have been taught, but they appear to be trustworthy. Remembering that family is the fundamental unit for human society, defending the child's need of love and acceptance, defending the child's right to family life, <clears throat> learning about thought reform processes, applying an objective definition of the child's best interest, raising awareness of suggestible questioning, reforming the system in court to handle custody disputes inspired by the Koka model in Germany, feeding the good, good wolf in the child are points to promote the children's need of and right to family life. In this episode, Dr. Lena Helblom Segreen is going to speak to us about this important topic that we all need to understand. Children have human rights and they're being violated. And this is a very important topic. So take note and let others know as well. We're also going to hear in this episode from um, Lisa Rothfuss. She's going to be one of our presenters at our upcoming fall conference. It's an international virtual conference, and it's entitled Alienation, the Truth Regarding the Trauma and the Abuse. It's a very important conference. I can't emphasize that enough, and you really want to be there. This is the most important conference we've ever done. And the topics and presentations are so strong. You as a professional and you as an alienated family member do not want to miss this. Not at all. So please, we're registering now. Many have registered all over the world. And we're very excited. We're going to start on Friday and one run straight through Sunday night at till 10 o'clock. And that means all night long. So uh, go to our website, familyaccess.info, and check out all of the uh, information there. And, and you can also register on the same page. We look forward to seeing you there. We're going to be back in just a minute with Dr. Sagreen and Lisa Rossas right after these messages. Sadly, too many know the pain and trauma associated with parental and grandparent alienation. Family Access, Fighting for Children's Rights, will present an important international virtual conference on October the 13th through the 15th, 2023. The conference entitled Alienation, The Truth Regarding the Trauma and Abuse, will feature world-renowned experts in the field of alienation. You'll join the conference event coordinator, Elaine Cobb, and moderator, Megan Hunter, as they introduce you to keynote speaker, Dr. Edward Kruk. Plus, you'll hear important presentations from Dr. Joshua Coleman, Lisa Rothfuss, Dr. Mary Alvarez, Chris Smith, Bill Eddy, Dr. Noel Hunter, Dr. Sue Cornblum, Dr. William Burnett, Megan Hunter, and Jordan Treger. Join the many attendees already securing their spot for the conference entitled Alienation, the Truth Regarding the Trauma and Abuse. For information, visit familyaccess.info for all the details. The special conference is being hosted by Family Access Fighting for Children's Rights, 
Steel Partners Foundation, and PASCA, Parental Alienation is Child Abuse. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision-making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being, too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. I am pleased to have been invited by you, Elaine Cobb, to uh, speak about promoting the child's need and right to family life. And uh, I want you to share with me uh, a, a picture of a tree, because a tree can be seen as a symbol for us all. And for the child, it's not difficult to understand that the child needs the whole root system not to fall. So that's why I use that symbol. But you know, in Sweden, it has been very hard to uh, get the message through that children are harmed seriously if they are cut off from a parent without any good reason and pressured to by themselves uh, reject that parent. But there are some books now in Swedish and um, we also translated, I translated Sene Beringens and Jill Harmon's book uh, about parents behaving badly. So it's a, it's a copy of, of their book, but in Swedish. And I have uh, corrected the Swedish translation. So this is a very good introduction to the whole theme. And my book was a result of a research project. It's called the Child's Right to Family Life, 25 Swedish Studies of Parental Alienation. And in this book, it, it is a result of a three-year uh, research project. I had a scholarship to, to uh, realize. And these 25 uh, case studies, eight of them concern mothers who were uh, rejected and lost their contact with their children. And the rest are fathers. And the sad fact is that three of these case studies ended with death. And also a sad fact for me was that um, the children's human rights were violated. The very fundamental right to family life, to keep identity, and to be able to speak freely the, the child's own conception of the situation. So all these three human rights were violated. The, the, the book in the middle is written by a, a, a journalist and a lawyer and the book on the right, it's called The Betrayal. It's a, it's a case study by a lawyer. So the theme is now what can be done to promote children's need of and right to family life. And I will summarize the, I have pointed down, I have written down eight points I would like to make and I read them to you first and then 
I'll go back to them. By remembering that family is the fundamental and natural group for human society and for developing humanity in the children. First point was that. Second, by defending the child's need for love and acceptance from the child's family members for the child's own well being. Three, by defending the child's human right to family, life, and to keep identity. Four, by learning about thought reform processes and when discovered, take measures to stop it. Five, by making decisions and acting in accordance with the child's best interests, objectively defined. I'm sorry for my English, I'm not, it's not my home language. Six, by raising awareness about suggestibility and about how easy it is to create false memories and thus influence children to believe things have happened that never occurred. Seven, by reforming the system to handle custody disputes in direction of consensus for the sake of the child's well-being. Eight, by feeding the good wolf in the child. Now, back to number one. In Article 16, Section 3 in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, it says, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. And by family, it, the, it, it's referred to biological family. It is not about foster families. And I just want to mention Heidi Fried, you know, a survivor of the Holocaust, who came to Sweden and did a very important work lecturing in schools, telling about her experience. And she was asked what questions she got from the pupils. And she said uh, that the most common question put to her was, what is the worst you have experienced? And what do you think her answer was? Her answer was to be separated from my parents. The Holocaust survivor answered that. And that makes me reflect on the research we have on children in crisis situations and war situations, children who have been evacuated. It is shown that they are better off if they can stay with their parents, although it's a war going on. And this was also demonstrated by the refugees from uh, children, refugees from Finland in the Finland uh, civil war. These children have had problems uh, with their identity and their uh, mental health, many of them. It is reported in several books. Number two was uh, by defending the child's need of love and acceptance from the child's family members for the child's own well being. And uh, we know that rejected children or children who feel rejected can develop many psychological problems, often lifelong. And based on human accumulation, accumulated human experience over decades, we know that children need their family. We also know it from research. Among important research studies, we have a global meta study performed by uh, Ronald Rohner and Abdul Kalek. And the conclusion was that it's a global need in all children, in all of us to have uh, love and acceptance from both our parents. Or those, those who are as parents, because if there are situations where children do not have parents, but then if some other people, adults come and take that responsibility, it can't be the paid foster parents because they can quit and they can, they, they, their job ends when the child is 80. 
The third point I made was by defending the child's right to family life. And um, in Article 2, 12 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, not, nor to attacks upon his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. We also have Article 8 in the UN Convention of the Rights of the Children. State parties undertake to respect the right of the child to preserve his or her identity, including nationality, name and family relations as recognized by law without unlawful interference. And we can conclude, you know that all that a child who has been alienated is deprived of his or her identity. We also have this right to family life in the European Conven Convention on Human Rights. <clears throat> Number four of the points promoting the child's need and right to family life is by learning about thought reform processes and when discovered how to take measures to stop it. In the world uh, thought reform process I have from a colleague, the late psychologist Margaret Taylor Singer, who is met with more than 3,000 sect members. And she wrote the book Cults in Our Midst. It was published 2003, I think, yeah. And the undertitle was The Continuing Fight Against Their Hidden Menace. And it was a foreword by Roy, Robert J. Lifton. And she wrote down five, six criteria how this thought reform process can be described. And um, I want to uh, repeat them because in nev nearly every disputed custody case that I thoroughly have investigated during 30 years and research, I have found that the process of taking control over a child has so many similarities with uh, sects, and this is, has been pointed out also by Amy Baker and other uh, knowledgeable people. So I take this uh, now these six criteria that uh, Margaret Taylor Singer summarized. One is to keep the person unaware that there is an agenda to control the chain to change the, or change the person. Two is to control time and physical environment, contacts and information. Three is to create a sense of powerlessness, fear and dependency. Four is to suppress old behaviors and attitudes. Five, to install new behavior and attitudes. Six is to put forth a closed so system of logic and everything what she mentions here fits in, as I see it, with a, a severe alienation process. And the child being put through this has not chosen this. There is no informed consent from the child's, from the child's side. And you can describe it as a successful mental kidnapping as uh, did uh, Pamela Robertson. She wrote that book about her son and his uh, suicide called Kidnapped, A Kidnapped Mind. Now to number five of the points I made initially. That is to, we can promote the child's need of love and uh, right to family life by making decisions and act in accordance with the child's best interests. And the child's best interests can be seen as a, son, 
as a summary of the research and the human rights articles included in national law, at least in Sweden and I think in many other countries also, but it's a uni the universal human rights we can always refer to. And if we uh, make a de definition, an objective, objective and general definition of the child's best interest, I suggest it to be like this. The child's best interest is to be well enough taken care of with love and acceptance by both parents or those who are there for the child as parents. Not to be abused physically or mentally or emotionally and to have the right to grow up in close contact with both parents and their family networks, including, of course, then grandparents and firstly, and thus have the right to keep his or her identity respected and to be able to speak out his or her opinion on matters concerning him or her freely without ever being pressured to choose between the parents or between own family members and foster parents. A good enough parent, we can define a good enough parent from this uh, definition of the child's best interest. A good enough parent can, following that we know what we know about the child's fundamental need and the child's legal and human right to family life, be defined as a parent who in action demonstrates that the child is allowed to love the other parent and to have regular close contact with that parent and that parent's family, because that is what the child needs for the child's own well-being. There is a saying that good enough parents give their children both roots and wings. And you can go back to the picture of the tree because you have the whole branch system and that's the wings. Going back to my points, we have number six. You can promote the children's need of and right to family life, but by raising awareness about suggestibility and about how easy it is to create false memories and thus making a child believe he, he or she has seen things they never saw or have experienced things they, that never occurred. And this is a mystery to many people. How can a child believe that one parent and all on other people on that parent's sides are all good? and all on the other parent's sides are all bad. How can that come about? And um, we know, and I think you all know, that it's about suggestibility. Uh, it's about isolating the child and uh, put information and suggestions in questions to the child based on preconceived ideas uh, and thus reforming the thoughts, the child's thoughts and mentally kidnap the child. And now I just want to give you an example. It's not about parental alienation. It's, it's about a situation where a test leader, a Swedish suggestibility researcher who presented his thesis in 1958, his name was Carl Gustav Stukat. He had a test, a suggestibility test with a nine-year-old girl. And she was shown a picture where there was water and a motorboat. And there were some other natural objects. There was no barrel with herrings. There were no birds and there, there was no dog. And I give you some of the the conversation, the dialogue between the test leader and this girl. And it goes like this. What kind of boat is it? Motorboat. You saw the barrel with herrings behind the boat, didn't you? Yes. What did it look like? 
It was round. You saw the herrings, didn't you? No. How do you know there were herrings in, in it then? Because it was a barrel for herrings. Tell me, did you see the seagull flying or did it sit on a boat on the roof? It sat on the roof. What color was it? White. How did it move the wing, the wing like this? And the girl demonstrated uh, the sea, how the seagull did. And the other seagull, what did it do? Flew. But were they not in a fight, those two seagulls? Nope. Are you quite sure of that, that they were not fighting about a herring? Both wanted? Yeah. And then it goes on, and the story, she creates the story from the questions where much information is given and many suggestions are given. and. Uh, she uh, 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 adopts these suggestions. And the conclusion from the researcher test leader is, and test leader is that she was unusually uh, easy to influence, but it's a fact that all children and all of us are uh, sensitive to suggestive questions and information we get in, in a question. And it's to varying degrees. Smaller children have been proven to be more suggestible. And it is, above all, uh, it, it affects volatile uh, and uncertain uh, observations. For this girl, for example, she kept to the her first answer that it was a motorboat, although the test leader tried to suggest it was another boat, but she, she kept to her observation that it was, and that was the, uh, the, the head thing in the picture that she had observed. So through suggestions of, in the questions to children, false memories are easily created. And the child must be given the opportunity to correct these established false memories of the cut-off parent, as we are talking now about, by meeting that parent and have own experiences, not have the picture that has been given through those people who are hostile and influence the child to hate or be afraid of that parent and all the relatives on that parent's side. I'm coming to the end. Now I have number seven. By reforming the system to handle custody disputes in direction of consensus for the sake of the child's well-being. That's another way to promote the children's need of and right to family life. And now I want you to take a glimpse of a, a model that was uh, actually the basis for reforming law in Germany. It's called uh, the Kochem model. Kochem is a part in, in Germany. And I'm sorry to say that it has not been developed, but somehow it has been stopped. I don't know the, the actual facts now, actual situation, but I was in Kaunas in 2015 in Lithuania to to lecture, and the, the, it it was meant that my colleague Ursula Kodjo from Germany should have been there, but she she was taken ill, so I had to give her presentation of this Kochen model model in Germany, and uh, so this is her uh, her picture that she presentation that she made for that conference and it, it, she called it guidelines in a nutshell <clears throat> and i am impressed and inspired by this model because it's it it's based on uh, children's perspective uh, perception of time you know children have other perception of time than we adults have so for them 
three weeks is, is a very long time. And, and this model is, says that within three weeks, the, the, the parents who are, are addressing the court have to have found uh, ways for the child to be in contact in everyday life with both of them. And the judge is responsible as a director, you can say, uh, and uh, defines what is accepted and what is not accepted. And it is not accepted for the lawyers to uh, have denigration in their papers to the courts. It's only allowed to have matter of fact information, you can say. And um, no one is allowed to, to put forward den denigration. And, and the judges set the date for the hearing in no longer than up to six weeks and accept no lawyer's application for change of date make a case of not allowing the children to suffer any longer from parental disputes, protect the children and each parent's right to ongoing relationships with the child. So it's, it's a way also for the parents to have their uh, parental authority respected. But if the judge is informed that one parent has uh, interfered with the, with the child's right to have contact with the other parent. The judge uh, clearly explains that this is to your not to your benefit. This can make it harder for you to have shared custody. So the, the result of this model <clears throat> can be summarized that the judge decides what information is put before the court and how the trial is run. The court is flexible so it can meet the needs of any given case. It is less costly and saves time. It is inclusive with the regard to all parties involved. It may be less informal than a usual case. It seeks cooperation rather than opposition. It tries to reach agreement through dispute resolution. And when I had the information about the first years of practice with this model, the results were rather impressive because they, within three months, they had resolved and got a, mutual agreement uh, that functioned between the parents so that the children could keep uh, contact in everyday life with both of them. Of course, this is possible when one of the parents has serious uh, uh, personality disorders, then it can be very difficult. And, and so the it's also, there are psychologists and social workers also involved and they can have um, family therapy and individual therapy also. But in some cases, it's not possible to have a, a, an agreement with the parents that can function. My last point was by feeding the love wolf. I don't know if you have heard the story about a grandfather sitting with his grandson telling the boy, in us all there are two wolves fighting. One is love, the other is hatred. Who wins? asks the boy. The grandfather answers, the one we feed. So, I think that the most important thing we can do for our children and grandchildren for promoting their best interests and their right and need of love and to, of family life and for humanity and worker is to feed 
the love wolf all we can all we can thank you for listening and goodbye Hi, my name is Lisa Rothfuss, and I'm a licensed psychotherapist here in Austin, Texas. I have over 36 years of experience working with parents, children, and families, and I specialize in reunification therapy and treating issues of alienation and estrangement in high-conflict families. In my practice, I treat families struggling with mild, moderate to severe alienation, and I even offer a four-day reunification intense intervention for families suffering from severe alienation. I worked for nine years in the Texas family court system as a guardian ad litem and a parent coordinator or a co-parent counselor and a court appointed reunification therapist. And I offer various YouTube videos, workshops and trainings on reunification and the treatment of alienation. But today, I want to talk with you about an issue that I feel affects the majority of people I work with in my practice, and that is the issue of trauma. Next year, in October 2023, at the Family Access International Conference, we will be focusing on the truth about the impact of trauma on parents and grandparents who've been alienated from their children and their grandchildren. I have seen firsthand in my practice how alienation can cause parents to feel desperate, angry, and traumatized, not just by the rejection of their child, but also by the court system, which they often feel has failed them, and the long-term financial impact of maintaining a legal fight to keep a connection to their child. A common myth about trauma is that you only experience it after a life-threatening event. In fact, trauma is defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual as actual or threatened death or harm. But professionals like myself that work with alienation every day have a very different perspective. We would define trauma not so much by the event itself, but by the emotional and psychological effect it has on the person. Parents experiencing alienation are often anxious, agitated, angry, afraid, and grieving, trying to manage a life event that is ongoing and causing them significant emotional and psychological distress. My presentation at the conference titled, Creating a Path Forward, Cultivating Growth Out of Trauma, will focus on how to help participants make sense of the complexities of trauma, explore the various types that affect alienated parents and their children, the effects on the mind and the body, and the most effective forms of treatment, and the five major misconceptions about trauma. And finally, we'll discuss the dual nature of trauma, how it can be cruel and destructive force or a vehicle of transformation how it can lead to a newly defined psychological state called post-traumatic growth and its ability to cultivate resiliency. I hope you will join me for this presentation as I look forward to sharing this information with you. And please be sure to check out my other videos on my YouTube channel about reunification and dealing with parenting issues around alienation. You can reach me at lisa at rothfuss.com or go over to my website, lisarothfuss.com. I look forward to talking to you.
Next week on Families Divided TV, we will hear from an alienated grandmom and her story of how she fights to see her murdered son's children.